Perth. My name is Paul Franzon, I'm a professor at North Carolina State University. And one of the things I do is I'm a site director for a center, the Center for Advanced Electronics Through Machine Learning, which is mispronounced as CAMEL, <laughs> but not, not C-A-M-E-L, C-A-E-M-L. Uh, and uh, what we do in the center is apply machine learning to problems in electronic design automation. We do that for uh, chip design problems. We do that for board design problems. And um, we do also, for, we also have projects in hardware security and underlying algorithms. We've had many projects run through the center. There's many projects active right now. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, one is in a high-speed receiver. It's very time consuming to simulate it accurately. And you want to evaluate it for different settings in the receiver for the filters. And so recently we produced a model using a, a deep learning technique called long short-term memory that accurately captures the behavior of such a receiver and allows you to do a simulation and thus tuning the parameters uh, very, very, very quickly. Uh, another recent project is applying, uh, again, deep learning uh, to uh, design rule checking on chips. In modern silicon chips, there's tens of thousands of rules. They're very complex. Uh, a human is, is now beyond the scope of a human to understand the rules, understand how to design the rules. So what we have is a interactive design rule checker that's, based, that's trained off the rule set that can interact with the human designer to very quickly allow the human designer to resolve trade-offs related to the design rules. This is just two of the, the recent projects in the center. So the, the mission of the CAMEL Center uh, is to uh, produce better models for electronic design, uh, including aspects of reliability, uh, design rules, uh, optimization, uh, circuit design, interconnect design. Uh, we cover a variety of areas, including a, a lot of projects related to end reliability. We also have projects in uh, hardware security, uh, how to use machine learning to better secure the hardware against uh, uh, attacks such as the recent micro semi attack, which got a lot of press. So what's the difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence? Uh, that, that's, that's a loaded question, which we get different answers from different people. I'm an engineer, I'm a pragmatist. Uh, to me, machine learning is a technique where you get a lot of data and you analyze that data to produce quick to run models that are trained directly off the data. There are other techniques that together make up the field of artificial intelligence, such as expert systems, uh, uh, which have been around for quite a while, uh, and other solutions. Uh, however, the big change recently is in uh, uh, the ability to develop models from the data using a variety of techniques, rather than have to have a human think of how to build a model. Uh, I wouldn't call that artificial intelligence, but it's, it's rolled into the field of artificial intelligence. But personally, I don't think we're approaching a singularity because we can train a model to recognize a cat. Are there business benefits for machine learning and EDA? Uh, yes, there are. Now we're a membership-based center, so we have uh, uh, many member companies. Of, of course, they make the business case internally of the companies, and they don't tell us because we talk to a lot of people. So they don't want to leak their business model to us. But the business benefits are that you can create new EDA tools that are data-driven rather than driven by the creation of new algorithms, which is much more complex and longer time to bring to market. And for the companies using the tools, they can create better, more optimized designs and make the, the, the tools don't replace humans because there's a shortage of humans that can do this sort of thing already, but they enable them to be more productive uh, and design more transistors a day, more boards a day, or whatever we want to do it. So that of course, both of those translate into uh, business benefits for the EDA vendor or for the company using the end tools that we produce. Uh, first of all, I just want to clarify something. Quite often, even in our center, our code goes directly to the end user companies and they often use it directly. There's only certain codes that are worth productizing as, as an EDA tool. But if you're gonna have an EDA tool driven by data, then what becomes valuable is your data. Uh, and uh, what we find is that the, uh, our member companies who are doing designs are very protective of their data. So quite often what we do is generate our own data, which is representative of what the member companies might own but we don't redistribute the member company's data because mm. that's that data is the, is, the, is the new IP as you term it. Mm. So 
So the question is, how does an EDA vendor deal with this problem of the companies possessing the data? Well, there's a couple of solutions I've seen out there. Uh, one is uh, that sometimes they do get to collect their customers' data, though it might be encrypted or, or otherwise obfuscated uh, to protect key IP, or it might be open. Sometimes the EDA vendors have open access to a specific customer's data, up to them then to protect that data and not redistribute it. But the other solution I've seen is, is actually to use the examples generated by the university. We also generate kits, uh, design kits that are public domain. So they can be used openly for demonstrations, to demonstrate new tools, to, to, to prevent the need for sharing of data across companies. So we, uh, so we produce kits, we produce data, uh, not quite as big a data as a, a Samsung or an Intel would produce, but still big enough data to obtain a result from a, a data-driven tool. We've got a number of projects in, in formulation, uh, including improvements on current projects. Uh, another project just finished was uh, uh, analog design optimization with machine learning. Uh, in terms of, of, of my interests, uh, what I see is starting to push machine learning to go beyond model building and into design improvement uh, that is presenting options to human designer that might be viewed as the machine being creative, but only being creative in a small way, but still helping the human designer converge on a better design. I see a lot of interest in that. Uh, in, in addition, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I think there's big opportunities in applying quantum computing in a machine learning loop to, for a number of situations, and we're starting to look into that. And finally, in addition, we also, we do hardware as well. Uh, we've been uh, looking at how uh, inference engines can operate on the edge and interface with large memories to do real-time inference in edge computing solutions. Uh, to give an example of the sort of inference work we're doing, uh, that work is funded by DARPA, so we're looking at military examples. Uh, one example we're looking at uh, is enable uh, better, um, uh, enable unmanned aerial vehicles to better identify what they're looking at, how to track what they're looking at, and, and, and so forth. I came to DesignCon uh, frankly because I was invited yesterday to give a tutorial on machine learning. Uh, we, there we talked about the basics of machine learning and a little bit about the applications. And that tutorial is very well, very well attended. There's a lot of interest at DesignCon in, uh, in applying machine learning to problems that designers are facing, and in addition to building uh, machine learning inference and training engines. And of course at DesignCon, it's a very uh, industry focused conference. I, I can learn about uh, what are the, the problems people are facing as they, for example, go to what's next after PAM4 and 112 gigabits per second interfaces and things like that. And think about what some of the solutions might be to those problems. You're asking about data collection and, and preparation for machine learning. That is a key step to machine learning. What I'm, what I'm seeing more and more of is you can't just treat machine learning as a tool that you throw at a problem. Uh, data preparation uh, for the machine learning tools uh, is critical. Sometimes you need to do feature extraction. Sometimes you can uh, use just the raw data, uh, but you've got to think about it and say, okay, is this raw data uh, the right thing to present to the machine learning tools for training and inference? And often it's not. You have to do preparation on the data. How much data do you need for machine learning to be beneficial? Uh, as I'm sure you know, you need a lot. Uh, quite often what we do is uh, I'd take a combination of real designs, use that to generate synthetic designs to produce the data which has order of a million training samples in it. So it does, I must admit, it does vary from problem to problem. Uh, one thing we have been doing is doing uh, machine learning based optimization with as few as 50 samples. And that is doable with, for the right problem with the right set of machine learning tools. In that case, uh, uh, what's called surrogate modeling together with Bayesian optimization or the candidate algorithm. But other times, if you want to train a deep network, for example, you need a very large, very rich data set and you somehow have to generate the order of a million samples for that training data set. But there's ways of doing that and, 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 and those, those methods of generating that data in themselves are an intellectual exercise. So how can you generate a useful range of data 
uh, for training a deep learning model. Uh, you're asking about applications of machine learning and packaging. Yes, actually within our center, we produce machine learning models for the drivers, the interconnect structures, the receivers. Uh, we have a project right now at one of our systems at Georgia Tech within the center. I'm not running the project, but a colleague of mine is, where they're trying to use machine learning to identify the combinatorial worst case for simulation. So rather than simulate every net in the design, every crosstalk scenario in the design, use machine learning to produce a synthetic example of the worst case combination. And all you have to do is, is solve that problem to solve the design as a whole. Design con and the importance to the industry as a whole. Um, obviously, as an academic, I think education is important. And I, I think any engineer needs to continuously educate themselves um, and improve their knowledge base and improve their ability to execute. The world changes almost totally every five to 10 years. And, and engineers have to live with that cycle and be prepared for that cycle and prepare themselves for that cycle. Conferences such as DesignCon can uh, help educate engineers as to what the upcoming changes are, how to prepare themselves to them, for them, and sometimes even train them directly in how to prepare for those changes.